Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Henderson Lee. I'm the current chair of the Second Language Writing Interest Section um, group with TESOL, and we're so happy that you've joined us for our summer book club discussion with our guest author, Joel Block. I'll, um, I'll let my colleague Saduri in, give his formal introduction in just a bit. I want to provide you with just a brief heads up. Uh, Joel's going to introduce his most recent work um, with a short presentation, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. It's a small group, so hopefully you're comfortable using your microphone. If not, of course, use the chat box, and then we'll, um, we can navigate those questions for, for the, the larger group. Saduri? Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Sidri Christensen, and I, I have the privilege to introduce you, um, Joe Block. He has now retired after teaching composition courses, primarily focusing on publishing and academic writing, as well as courses on linguistics and literature. He has published books on digital literacy spaces, technology, plagiarism, and intellectual property, and digital storytelling. His most recent book, here, <laughs> Digital Spaces for Teaching Multilingual Writing has been published now by Multilingual Matters. He has published papers on plagiarism, um, argumentation, digital storytelling, and academic writing. He has been a peer reviewer for various academic journals as well. He has a PhD in rhetoric uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. He lives outside Columbus with his wife, five turtles, the occasional daughter, and a cat. Uh, on a personal note, I just want to share very briefly uh, the first time I met Joel. He doesn't know, and he probably does, but he probably remembers the setting. It was at um, Ula Connor's uh, Intercultural Rhetoric Conference. For those of you who attended uh, for a number of years, Professor Connor uh, would do this Intercultural Rhetoric Contrastive Rhetoric Conference in IUPUI. And I was a, grad, a newly graduate student, a master's degree. And my professor said, oh, let's go uh, to this conference. It's going to be great. Uh, the plenary speaker, pay attention. You'll learn a lot. I did not know who the plenary speaker was. I didn't know, know Joe Block, who's this guy, right? Uh, <laughs> and I went and to make this long story short, uh, it was a very engaging conference. I, I knew. I wanted to become a writer like Joel for many reasons. And the main reason is his ability to synthesize the history of a field in such an, um, an inviting and an easy way. It, he makes it look so easy. This book is no different. And I am so happy that he wrote a book in such a good time, it's very timely. And so I know that uh, you are gonna enjoy uh, this book as much as I, that I have reading it. So it's my privilege to introduce to you, um, Joel Block. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Saduri. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yeah, Saduri was one of my, I took I think the publishing class and then later we co-authored and I, I lived through her search for tenure, getting tenure at San Antonio. Um, let me see if I could pull up, let me look at my slides, okay. Um, so my book is called Creation of Writing Spaces for Multilingual Writers. And um, whoops, let me start. And this is, I, I kind of see this as a sequel to the previous books. I wrote a book on technology that University of Michigan Pre Press published, and then another book by Multiling the Multilingual Matters published on intellectual property and plagiarism. And um, I saw this, I, I wasn't totally sure I was going to retire as I was writing this book, but it became a kind of memoir about my experiences teaching writing. Um, it was largely written before the pandemic, although I was able to revise it during the pandemic. And the pandemic had a tremendous impact on the role technology plays in, in teaching. So um, I tried to work a few things in, some of the issues that were beginning to emerge, but um, I'm not sure if 
if you wrote the book now, it would look a little different than it was. Um, the book is really about changes. As, as um, Sidori mentioned, I'm really interested in historical changes. And one of the things there's been is a kind of historical change in how, tech, how literacy is valued, the different social contexts in which it's valued. And this book is really partly about that. And the other part, of course, it's about teaching. Oops, sorry. And what's been the impact of technology on literacy and pedagogy? One of the things that kind of motivated me throughout the book, I, I, I was kind of this expression, the sage on the stage and the guide on the side. That's a metaphor, or whatever, that's often been used about teaching. And the one thing I always, when people use this metaphor is, who gets paid more? Who's got higher prestige? Who gets grants and travel allowances? The sage or the guide? And it's always, and even though we sometimes as teachers like to think of ourselves as guides that we're learning a, along with our students, sages are better. So what I tried to do in this book is provide a way for teachers to become designers and have their own unique role in the design of writing spaces. And at the same time, they could provide more autonomy to their students so they could write what they were interested in. And one of the things that the current sense of, of teaching writing is to value students' stories and language more. And my argument is that digital, even though I, I rarely hear people talk about technology in these terms, um, they value, it's th these kinds of ways, are, these kinds of technologies and spaces very important in, in valuing students' stories and their language. Um, the first chapter I wanted to look, I wanted to look a little bit at the efficiencies and disruptions. Um, in the 19th century, if you remember, if you if you remember, if you ever read um, the the essay emerged and disrupted the way teaching had been going on in the university. So before the essay, there was a lot of more oral, oral evaluation. After the essay was introduced in the late 19th century, it became dominant. And so again, what I wanna argue here in this book is that now technology, technological spaces are disrupting the essay in the same way the essay disrupted um, oral disputation in the 19th century. Um, I think technology is very interesting in addressing all the controversies and problems that exist, whether we're talking about rhetorical issues such as the role of audience or um, applied linguistics, uh, linguistic issues such as trans, trans languaging. Technology plays a role in our understanding and addressing how we are going to look at it. Um, it's no question it's placed a lot more burden on teachers. Um, one of the things uh, that, again, I, I'm very interested in is to evaluate the affordances of a technology. And um, affordances draws upon the work of Norman. Norman's argument was basically about a um, door handle <laughs> and, and how door handles are designed differently and how they help you do what you need to do. So when you see a door handle, you know exactly how to open the door. And in some ways, technology lends itself to thinking about how every instance of technology does some impact on the student. And um, that impact is neither, we, I've argued this forever, it's neither deterministic in the sense that it doesn't say, oh, if you use this technology, this is going to happen, nor is it neutral, which means if you introduce the technology, something different is going to happen than in the, in the regular classroom. And so there's been this movement, and it's, it's not a dichotomy, but rather a development from writing academic papers to digital literacy. So 
I, I just wrote a, a paper that's coming. I think I'm not sure it's come out yet or not. It's a chapter in a book on argumentation. And argumentation is thousands of years old. But now with digital storytelling, which one of the things I'm most interested in, it's a it's a it's a different form of argumentation. So we're still talking about the same kind of argumentation, but just a new different technology. So every technology, you know, one of the difficulties for teachers, particularly, is that the technologies are changing. So as you have new technologies, every new technology you have is brings a new set of affordances and, and new pedagogical problems and issues that you need to address. Um, and as I mentioned, talk more at the end of the book, um, exactly the, the new technology, I am clueless how to use, but you have to, somebody, another generation will write another book or teach in a different way. And so you'll hear things like blockchain or, or artificial intelligence and all of these new ideas will eventually work themselves into teaching composition. Um, it's, it's a little ironic and, and, and I'm kind of hoping nobody actually asks me. I, it, the book is a big proponent for openness, even though I had it published with a traditional publisher who's charging, say, I think $50 for the book. You might ask, why didn't you have an open access publisher? And there are personal reasons for that. But in generally, though, I think the publisher adds a lot to the book. Um, I, I really like, though, this, this concept of openness and the way in which technology and these technological spaces are more open. Um, I like the um, metaphor of Raymond's metaphor about marketplaces that that we should think about the, the world and technology as being where people have multiple places of entry that they bring with them. It's not like he, he contrasts it to a cathedral, which has one dominant entrance and everyone has to pass for it. And I, it's more like a marketplace where you can bring what you want and you have multiple places of entry. So all of the chapters in the book from MOOCs and flipped classroom and publishing, all of these chapters have to do to some degree with the way in which openness works um, in the classroom. Um, one of another area which has been very important, which I don't totally have a handle on, but this actually became a big issue during um, the pandemic was how do you assess introducing technology to what it was before. And I think universities in particular are going and schools of all kinds are going to have to take a lot of time, not only assessing how their technology is different, but what technologies they want to keep or what technologies they want to get rid of. Um, I began thinking about assessing you know, an individual use of technology. I never worked out a very good way of doing it. Um, it became, for example, with a digital story, I began assessing it more on, did I understand the voice or, or was it too loud? Things like that, rather than this actual quality. Um, so one of the things that's come out and one of the issues is this notion of ungradedness, which is, um, you don't grade things. And so I, I, and one of the issues that when I taught particularly publishing, I never graded I didn't have to grade the papers. Um, a number of, of the technologies kind of lend themselves not to grading things. MOOCs were quite well known for that. And so um, one of the issues that this raises is how does the design of these technological in spa spaces impact the design of regular traditional classroom spaces? Um, the other kind of challenge of using technology for teaching is that it's constantly changing. Um, that it's that and one of the perspectives I have is is that not everyone have it's I'm always using old technologies and new technologies, and I kind of mix them together. So one of the theories that I work with is the idea that. Um, you know, if the technology isn't working, maybe you can find a different technology. And I do a lot of that with um, 
with blogging. Um, we started, actually, I started with um, web page design. I then began to realize that I don't really know enough about web page design to really teach it very well. So I went to blogging. And then from blogging, we began to see that, that the students were telling stories. So we looked for a technology that emphasizes storytelling. And we went to digital storytelling. But then I went back to blogging and I kind of integrated blogging with digital storytelling. So it's always it's not about using a technology as a particular tool, but it's about putting all of these technologies together. And then what's the result is the relationship between traditional and digital literacies. And this can, becomes a question of how new literacies are being valued in the classroom. I was fairly conservative, and this is this has impacted the way I teach, which is that I didn't really want to substitute um, one and say a digital literacy for a traditional print literacy. So I ran them together, and then I began to explore how they interacted with each other. Um, there's a really kind of good metaphor for that that. Audrey Waters does, and she has a new book coming out, and which I haven't read. It's not published yet. It'll be out in the end of the summer. Um, about the about, she talks about luddites, and we often, for example, use the term luddite to mean someone who's against technology. But um, I like to use it, and she uses it about the nature of technology. So it's not the technology itself, but how it's being used, and. The book follows a very traditional way of looking at technology that um, it always follows the, the teaching goals. That, that's kind of, you'll hear that everywhere. Um, that teachers need, will start with your goals for what you wanna do and then you find the technologies to achieve that rather than starting with the technologies and seeing where that leads you. And as I said, it's constantly new technologies. Um, and, and technologies become more prevalent in certain situations. Um, so for example, um, one of the things that you saw during the pandemic, I know I have a daughter in college and one of the things that frustrated her was, was these monitoring programs that they used to monitor her while she was taking exams and they would cut her off if, if she over, took overshot the time. And she called up one time hysterical about this. But you know, we I had heard about these technologies. I didn't really know much about them until you know during the pandemic, they became very prevalent and became very controversial. Um, other, you know, older technologies like Turnitin, which is a major technology used in for comp, for plagiarism detection. Um, I, I, a student came to me the other day, actually, and said he, she, he had highlighted some passages that Turnitin had um, highlighted regarding plagiarism. And, and for him, Turnitin was a technology that he could use to help him avoid plagiarizing. The problem was none of the passages were really plagiarized. And he didn't care. He, the, the program flagged these passages and he wanted help. In, in paraphrasing them. So um, teachers are really have to deal with new technologies constantly. And that's why it's very important to sort of have a personal learning, learning network um, where you can find help. Because one of the things I hear a lot is that teachers feel isolated from each other. So it's very important to find places. I, I like um, the, the, Evo Electronic Village Online that TESOL has, which I think is very useful. Um, I usually just kind of just sit through it, even though I think it's really, if you're just kind of getting started with a technology, it's a very good place where to meet other teachers who have the same problem. Okay, so that's my introduction. And, and um, Chidori, I can send it back to you and you can um, start the conversation.
Thank you, Joel, and um, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Sara, right now is the time for questions and answers, right? All right, so if anybody has any questions or comments, um, please unmute your microphone or raise your hand and we can, or, or type in the chat and we can read that for you. Oops, where did you go? I can go. Go Hi, for it. Joel. Um, so I, can you hear me well? I can hear you. I just lost something. So, but go ahead. I will, okay. I will thank it. you, Joel. First of all, it's good to see your face as yeah, always. Thank and thank you for this insightful, um, introduction to your book. I really look forward to reading it. And I, I'm especially impressed by, uh, intrigued by your, um, concept of openness in writing. And I've been really into, um, lately looking at, life writing, storytelling, and how we could use these uh, more innovative or, or personal writing and academic writing. And I think your, your, your um, concept of openness in writing to me also equals to um, creating socially just classrooms and equity, bringing equity and equity, I guess. And I'm, I, I guess my question is about assessment, right? You mentioned that this, the new technologies put a lot of burden on teachers. And I'm curious if you have um, any knowledge or any insights on community assessment. Um, I'm specifically referring to um, Asoa's uh, most recent book, which I haven't um, read yet, the anti-racist writing um, assessment, ecologies, I believe. So, if we are thinking about not putting the burden only on teachers, how can you make sure? How can we make sure that in the classroom we create equitable assessment practices, right? Um, yeah, I, as I said, I kind of punted on this one, mm -hmm. on the creating practices, um, because I really struggled with it. As I was trying to write an article about it, and I totally failed, and I gave up. Um, in terms of the assignment itself, I think it's very interesting because it allows you to, the students to bring in the stories. So for example, with digital storytelling, the students choose the stories, they choose the text. So in many ways, it's very different than the, what, the way, in fact, I teach traditional academic writing where I make the assignment and I make, and I say, read these texts. The students, on the other hand, um, when they when I had the digital story, the only assignment I wanted was actually the sort of classic way of doing a digital story was to find a story that's interesting to tell. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell a story about that, but I won't. But um, so it brings in the other stories and the other forms of language. Um, actually, the only the debate we used to have with with the teach other teachers was, can you understand the story? I mean, I had a kind of limit about rock music and my students like rock music more than I do. Um, I've learned a little as my daughter grew older about rock music, but um, you know, I found some of it annoying, but the other teachers would listen to it. Oh, that's not a problem. So the only thing I ever required the students to do in terms of assessing the story itself was, was it understandable to me? Mm -hmm. And that's where I kind of came in. But whatever they did, whatever images they used or whatever, um, I had specific goals for the story. So for example, um, we, were, we talk a lot about intellectual property law and I wanted them to get a sense of what their rights were to use intellectual property. And so I had them, um, argue for fair use. So they choose the images from the internet rather than create their own. And it could have been copyrighted images, but I argued you're allowed to use them. <clears throat> the bigger problem actually came with the music because music is copyrighted in a different way sure. and it reflects a different kind of concept. So, um, but, um, you know, a lot of teachers, for example, might say, okay, you only can use creative commons or, or you can only use your own images. And nowadays that's more common, but I wanted them to understand fair use. So I put, the, I put that in as a requirement. And then I said, okay, now you can go out 
and just choose whatever images you want, you know, yeah. and regardless of whether they're copyright, you have the right to use those images. Right. And so in that sense, much of what I tried more to build in some of these factors and try to assess them after the fact. I, I just never had a really clear way. The one thing we were able to do at the end of the semester was everybody got to, had to screen their, their um, stories. And, but again, that, that, that could have been part of the assessment um, where the class evaluates them, but even that, you know, I, I didn't. So when I went to teach other classes, I took the same idea of creating some artifact and saying, okay, if you create the artifact, that's what you, you're, that's all you need to do. Right. You know, you know, I don't care if it's good or not good or correct or incorrect. And so I use that strategy that I took from one technology, which actually had been taken from another technology and then tried to apply it. So uh, that's as far as I really got with assessment. I, I'm, I'm not an assessment expert. Sure. Thank you, Joel. Um, while people get ready for their questions um, or type their questions in the chat, I just have a very follow-up, um, I mean, a quick follow-up uh, question. Uh, it's related to that, um, well, yeah, assessment, but also um, the, the um, like on page seven, <laughs> uh, because uh, Joel, you say that these technologies or these new digital spaces can support the new approaches to literacy and pedagogy, such as translanguaging, by allowing you know the students to bring in all their linguistic resources. Well, you know that that's a topic kind of close to my alley. Yeah. But also, so I want you to to to. It's a two prong thing. So one, um, what do you envision? Um, you know the role of these technologies to be like with with these uh, translanguaging perspectives and second that has to do with assessment what would a person um assess or how would they would they be assessed in the same way as a digital storytelling because we're not experts in all the languages that our students speak right well you you know more about translanguaging than i do um and it's like in in your work where you look at say, I don't know if it's Facebook or some technology that looks like Facebook. <clears throat> it's the idea that these technologies, <clears throat> for the most part, come in from the outside. And one of the things I've done for many years is simply encourage students to write in their own voices and then use their voices. And again, this is part of the process of um, it's part of the process of assessment, although it's not assessment in terms of, did you write grammatically okay, but did you make it interesting? Um, you know, the, the book club had just finished a number of sessions on, on the five paragraph essay, okay? And um, one of the problems with the five paragraph essay is it's really boring to read because it's very impersonal, it's, you know, say it, what, tell them what you're going to say, then say it, then say what, tell them what you said. The students were struggling with that idea and I wanted the papers to be more interesting. So um, I noticed that in their blogs, they, they actually wrote more personal and evaluative information. So I would just tell them, go ahead, cut and paste from your blog and put it into the, you know, the conclusion of your paper. Now, I was still assessing the, the academic writing, but I wasn't assessing the blog, but I found the blogs were much more interesting in a sway to get to their, what they actually were thinking than they were academic papers. So in that sense, um, the, the technology and the assessment came together. Um, I don't know, I, I sort of got to the point before I retired where I began to look at the connection between digital literacy and academic literacy, but they, they were always assessed in different ways. I, I simply never really had a strong sense of how to assess digital artifacts uh, on what basis. 
Um, so I, I, I more or less, as I said, said, okay, do this, finish your project, and that's your that'll be for your grade. That'll be for your credit for the course. So there was something always in there about, yeah, you had to do it, but in terms of you know what language you use and whether you're writing, whether you uh, in a digital story, as you may know, you start, I used to start with a text, but whether the text was grammatically correct, it didn't matter. What mattered is that I understood what was going on. And so I didn't have to correct them, you know, um, or provide feedback to them on whether their story was correct or not, but um, or whether their grammar was correct, but whether the story was interesting. Um, that that was the assignment, and and it had to it had to be interesting. There had to be this moment in their life, you know. Um, that's that was my assessment. It didn't it didn't even have to be an interesting moment. Um, it just had to be a moment that they focused on. That was really the basis for assessment because that's what the technology that I was using and the approach that I was using was really looking at were these stories about these turning points in your life. So it just had to have a turning point. And that was a good story. It didn't have to worry about whether they had subject verb agreement or whether they used articles in the proper way. It, it, it was the turning point that I kind of evaluated the story on. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, yeah, I was going to um, kind of going back to Joel's introduction. Thank you so much, uh, Joel, again, for agreeing to be with us today. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that um, there would be some differences in the book post pandemic. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit on those. Well, I, I think some of the issues have become, I mean, there's obviously been more emphasis on looking critically at technology. I think all of the issues or many of the issues that, that had been raised about issues like privacy um, were raised before the pandemic. After, during the pandemic, they became central issue. Um, questions about accessing technology. You know, I mean, all of a sudden, everybody had to have the same technology if this was going to work. And they had to be able to access this in the same way. And then questions about how co courses looked. I think one of the difficulties, I saw this in, in, in my daughter's courses that she took, you know, she was home a great deal or home the whole fall semester because her university had shut down. So I got to see her classes and, you know, some of the teachers tried to replicate the existing class and make it online. And that's the question, you know, I try to look at in, in the book, in the particularly chapters on MOOCs and flip learning and things like that, but that's not, um, but that was something that became very central in, in um, after the pandemic was how do, how do you make a traditional class? How do you teach it online? Um, some of the things were happening in the world, at least in the publishing was one area that actually changed a great deal because of the pandemic. And there was much more emphasis on sharing information and, and using preprint servers and the repository. You know, again, this didn't impact teaching composition or publishing to maybe applied linguists or rhet rhet rhetoricians. It applied a great deal to publishing um, people in the sciences, especially. So there became a lot more sharing, um, the whole drive for the vaccine was a, was a study and how information is shared and evaluated. And um, that was much more opened up. The other issues, as I said, some of the greater uses, you know, I mean, very few people use these surveillance software products. Then all of a sudden, everybody was using surveillance software products. So what is surveillance? What about, what does it mean? 
these technologies like uh, facial recognition or or in, in the case when, when they simply looked at um, people taking tests. I know the parents, I, I was on a parent website or parent Facebook site, and I don't know where the pictures came from, but one, one somebody posted a picture you know, of, their, of a child taking their exam in the toilet because that was where they, you know, if somebody came in and disturbed them, the professor might think they were cheating. And there was another photo, which is of them locking their dog out because they didn't want their dog to come in in the middle of their exam. Again, you know, our daughter kind of locked herself away upstairs. We didn't see her take these tests. So we don't know until she came in with her own technological problems and said, oh, you know, the teacher, I got cut off in the last minute from finishing my exam. So these became whole new issues that I think a book written after the pandemic would have to come to, to address more than, than I, I addressed in the book itself. Um, particularly these new technologies and new ways of using technologies and the whole question of teaching online versus teaching in the classroom. Um, those were issues I, I, you know, they were there, they were, I touched upon them, but they weren't the central issues and, and they would need much more discussion in a book written after the pandemic. Thank you, Joel. That's, uh, yeah, I, there are, um, and, and you called in the book, I mean, you call for, for teachers who, right now everybody was thrown into digital spaces, right, to, to teach. And, and you're calling um, in your book for a renewed, um, basically a critical way to look at technology. What would be your advice for someone who maybe during the pandemic was not a teacher, like novice, novice teachers? that are just getting started and and so number one what do you think the 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 teaching of second language writing will be like because we're not going back right to where we were so what do you think it will be like and second what what is um the suggestion that you have for novice teachers just getting into the the field well i think novice teachers getting into the field need to form networks um it's it's not easy to work alone in this area because it's constantly changing. So you need to know what other people are doing. Um, I tried, and as I said, it's, it's, it's a little hypocritical because I, I published this book with a publisher, but I, a lot of materials, for example, I tried to make open <laughs> so that teachers could, could find them and use them themselves and modify them. That is the value of Creative Commons and that it allows you to, you know, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so I think they need to be able to search out materials, but they also really need to be able to evaluate tools and, and what how to put them together. I think there's a, a sense when you first start teaching that, oh, you take an individual tool, like if you were, I, I'm not very handy, but if you take a hammer and um, start building something, you know, it's, it's not quite like that. You have to integrate one tool with another tool and you have to be able to understand the affordances of every tool. So they have to be able to, to do that. And <clears throat> excuse me, they may have to have networks and personal learning, you know, which of course increased a great deal during the pandemic because there are so many things on Zoom and other channels, but they, they really need to be able to, to, to reach out to other teachers. I, I've heard a lot teachers say they're very isolated that nobody else, you know, I've actually heard very little discussion, even issues like translanguaging that, that you do. Um, I've had very little discussion of technology. I was actually listening to a talk yesterday where the, the professor was talking about TikTok and she was talking about young, you know, bilingual Spanish speaking children, but I can't use TikTok. 
you know, I don't even know what TikTok does. I called my daughter after the lesson. What's TikTok? I hate TikTok. <laughs> so it's it's you know, I I, I don't know. It, it may be fine for for children. It may not be fine for college students. So that's kind of understanding that teachers need to know um, because they may not need they may not understand what works in a writing classroom. Um, they also have to learn agility, how to change on the spot. Um, that's one of the big things um, is, is that, that actually goes to the book, which is how to be agile. Um, I had to make some dramatic changes over the years. Some of it really just because of myself. Um, I, I, I remember trying to flip my writing class and, um, you know, I started off doing what teachers do but it didn't work. I just wasn't physically able to teach in that way. I was too big and my eyesight was getting worse. I couldn't see what the students were writing. So in the middle of the semester, I had to totally revise the way I was teaching, you know, in order to accommodate myself, you know, so instead of walking around looking at students, which is what the, the research had shown that's what you do, I had the students come to me and we had a series of sort of short tutorials, but I had to make that change for myself. I just couldn't, I wasn't physically able to, to do it in a way, but I had to be able to change the way the technologies were being used to fit my own limitations. And perhaps that, I don't know if you would agree, Joel, but perhaps that also means that, you know, the power is disrupted in the classroom, right? You talk about disruptions in your first chapter. So for the new teachers, perhaps thinking that students, some of them already come to classroom having mastered some of these digital tools. Um, so the knowledge is located not only in the teacher as traditionally has been accepted, but it's distributed among students, which kind of it's a nice thing. It's a good thing, both in terms of assessment, but also valuing students' voices, right? Valuing what they bring to the table, not only their language stories, but the knowledge base that they bring in the classroom becomes more valuable. Um, like, I have no idea how to use about TikTok, but I assigned um, their final assessment in one of my TESOL courses this semester. I gave them um, multiple options, and, and many of them <laughs> actually picked podcasts, TikToks and infographics and all sorts of digital technologies that I have no idea how to create, but I was um, trained by them. They literally taught me how to read it. So the reception, right, the reception of these texts became really important and really interesting to look at. So anyway, I just wanted to add that I think that dynamics is really interesting too. Like they already come with all this knowledge. I've had to learn from the first, I began teaching with technology. The first thing was web pages and I didn't know how to design them. And fortunately, the first semester I had students who knew how to design web pages. They knew a lot more than I did. Yeah. And through every technology, there was something. When, when we started digital storytelling, I had to learn about the relationship between print text and images. I knew nothing. I'm, I'm a print text person. And so I called, can you come to the classroom and help me? And one of the things you have to build in was how the technology was used. So even though when I taught, for example, digital storytelling, um, the stories were individual because I took that model of individual story. They could be collaborative, but I went individually, but we set the course up in a kind of lab. So the students had the chance to interact with each other and work with each other on their own individual story. So even though I was using a form that I, that was consistent with how I'd always taught, which is to, I value individual writing, um, th they were the ones who, who began to collaborate with each other. And I did not know the technology, you know, and I still don't know, you know, all the technologies well enough. So I could almost never teach a class where I, understood exactly what I was trying to do. That can be really frightening to novice teachers when you tell them um, you lose that sense of control, you know? So some of it I could build into the 
the assignment, like saying, okay, use your own stories as opposed to write an uh, academic essay on this topic. On the other hand, some of the things they had to do to create these stories, I did not understand the technology and they had to help each other. And you know, I would kind of go around and pretend I knew what I was doing, you know, because that's the way I am. But most of the time I, I just let them interact with each other. And fortunately I had set, I set it up. And, and I think you can kind of learn from that, that that has to be done ahead of time in, in terms of the planning of the, you, you have to have the students be able to. I mean, Digital Story was a really good example of that because it was one of those technologies that like, you know, TikTok or any of them that were out there already. They're out there a long time, you know, and um, I just tried to, trying to bring them into the classroom as, as a form of literacy. That itself is, is a very important concept. And, but, it, but it, it, you couldn't do the literacy in the same way uh, as I taught traditional print literacy when we brought in these technologies. That, as you said, that's one of the arguments for using the technology is the students already know them. They know how to you know, create movies. So I think it just reminds us too that for those of us that are teacher educators, you know, reframing disruption as opportunity um, and not something that's traumatic or negative is, is important in the work that we do. Just like we want our student writers in these in these classes with through digital liter literacies to increase autonomy and increase in experimentation. I think we want our teachers to also, our novice teachers to gain confidence in embracing disruption. And, and, you know, where you create a certain, I think, for example, with digital storytelling, there's been so many alternative ways of doing it, there's, you know, that, that, that gave, gives the students a little more freedom and flexibility than even I provided them. Um, you know, let's ask about the tools. Um, everyone had to use the same tool because that's, that's, what we, that's what I knew. But nowadays there's so many more tools that that's one of the areas where you know the students can bring in whatever tools they want you know um, I think at the time we started there wasn't you know essentially some of them had Macs and some of them had had um, DOS and that determined which tools they were using to create their stories and that actually impacted the nature of the story but there was nothing in the assessment that mattered whether you used a Mac or DOS, whatever you use, that was fine. It, there was a difference. In, there was you could tell what what digital stories were done on a Mac, um, but it, that had nothing to do with anything else except that's how they did it. And again, that's part of the idea that that there's not a one way of doing anything. You know, um, the the story. I I don't know if I should tell this, but um, I was at a conference with. Um, Joe, Joe Lambert, who, who had really started digital storytelling. And it was in Spain and I had a little too much sangria to drink. And I went up to him and I said, you know, Joe, your stories are more interesting than mine, you know? Cause he, he had shown a movie about a guy who had, he had grown up, he was beaten by his parents and grew up to be a pacifist. And I said, that's much more interesting. He said, he said Joel, everyone has a story. You know, and so that kind of goes back to the essence of as a technology, everyone has a story. They have something they can bring to the classroom, you know, and you know, they just had to shape it in such a way that fit some of the goals of the class, you know. Um, when, when I did this work on argumentative paper, I never assigned students to write an argument, but some of them did. Some of them created a digital story that was an argument that had all the classical moves that an argument have going back to um, you know, Aristotle. So um, that was really interesting to me, but you know, that they did that, they didn't have to do that. Um, I started this story, when, when I first started teaching it, I, I had done a story about the impact my dad had had on me. And I noticed that I was getting a bunch of stories about dads, you know, not necessarily 
as positive. My, I, I was very adoring of my father, but some of them were very critical of their fathers. That was really interesting to me, the way in which they took that assignment, even though I didn't, they didn't have to do anything about father. I just had this story I had done about my father. And, and, but they, they took the story and then they made it their own. And I think that was kind of the, one of the interesting things that was happening in the class. Well, Joel, um, we're at the end of our time, but really quickly before we go, Alicia had asked in the chat box um, if you're using any particular technology or tool for digital storytelling. Well, I started using the very traditional way of doing it. The, and which was, you know, they would write a story and then they would create a podcast of the story and then they would search for images and then they would use whatever program came with their computer and they would put, mix those together, their podcast and the, these images, and then they would create this final story. That's what I've done for many years. That was, but that's like, the old way. Now, you know, um, they're using cameras, which I've never mastered, <laughs> as my daughter will tell you. And, and I'm not, Daddy cannot use a cell phone. And I don't know how to use a cell phone. So, but they're using cell phones and they're using other of these editing programs and recording programs. And so they're using a lot more, a lot different programs. But I, I, basically stuck with what I, I knew, which was a very limited number of technologies. The, the key thing for me was to put them together. So they would podcast and they would use music and they would, they would have to adjust the music. And they would, we, we took them and we had a recording. Fortunately, we had a nice recording studio at the university and they recorded the podcast. And then their job was to mix the podcast with the images. And they and I didn't know how they did it. That was the part where, unlike the the um, traditional print text that they were also writing, they they went out and they searched the internet and they found whatever images they thought were appropriate for their story. And there are all kinds of them, you know. And some of them I understood, and some of them I I didn't. Some of them I learned. And one one story I I liked was. Um, a woman who did a story, she used images from a film that was very popular at the time that I had never seen. And I have met, called Mid, I think it's Midnight. It's about a, a, a teenager who falls in love with a vampire or something. It's a very popular series. She used, she took images from that. And I said, is that, that, that looks familiar. What movie is that? And I had to ask her. And so, you know, the, the tools were very open. It, it really just depends. Um, but if, if I said, if I had to say TikTok, I, I would have to go back and start saying, okay, how do you use TikTok? What tools do you use for TikTok? The point being is that, that I'm trying to make is that TikTok is different from the kind of story I use and has a different set of goals. And so all the infographic, which are again, much more important today than they were when I was doing, when I started off doing this, all of those technologies leads to the way information is put together in different ways. And so the teacher has to be able to understand that aspect of using the technology. So what's the difference between saying, okay, we're gonna do TikTok or we're gonna do this kind of traditional digital story in terms of each of the technologies is different. And it's the differences that are going to be important to understand in terms of designing the space. Thank you again so much, Joel. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with all me. of you and, and, and with you, Joel, especially. Just a quick um, reminder for those of you who are here, we're gonna try to have a follow-up event uh, related to our discussion today where um, a few of our IS members share technology tips for the writing class, the L2 writing classroom, and we'll, we're aiming for early August so we can jumpstart our fall semester. So stay tuned on our social media pages and my TSOL if you follow us. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you everyone for coming. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> People